angels, demons. I fear their conflict will soon engulf the world of men. And when it does, what hope will there be when even the wrath of angels cannot be quenched? Welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where I dig up old creatures and ideas from editions past for use in your 5th edition D&D campaign. Even the newest DMs are familiar with the idea of angels in the D&D world. You've got your astral devas and your planetars and of course your solars, the badass archangels of the heavens. And a lot of these angels, or the idea of what we picture angels as in D&D, have kind of persisted throughout all of the editions. However, 4th edition was the exception to this rule. In 4th edition D&D, you will not find the Solar or the Planetar or any of the Archons, like the Hound Archon that I've spoken about in previous videos. Their idea of angels are a lot more vague. They kind of just exist as these divine, faceless entities that serve different deities. According to the actual lore given by the 4th edition books, they're literally just created from the astral stuff. Literally, that's what it says. They are just spawned by the stuff of the astral realm, and then they exist basically to serve the needs, wants, and desires of the gods and deities powerful enough to draw them in. It even suggests that some of these angels might not be necessarily beholden to a deity or pantheon, and that they kind of operate on their own. There's a lot about this idea that I don't like, because I feel like the Solars and the Planetars have a very interesting place in the D&D multiverse, but there's also a lot about this idea that I find really useful, and I think there can be some really good ways that we can adapt this for use in our campaigns. One major thing we need to talk about and understand before we really get into this is that in 4th edition there was sort of a narrative that was being pushed by wizards and that was the Dawn War. There was this idea that at the beginning of time there was this crazy war between all of the gods and deities against the primordials and the elemental beings that existed within the elemental chaos. The whole idea was that the forces of law and the deities clash with the forces of chaos, the primordials. So on one side of this, you had all of the elementals that were seeking to destroy the gods here, fire, earth, air, water elementals, all that stuff. On the other side of this, you had the deities and their angelic armies. The resulting battle ended up in the creation and destruction of many of the deities in the D&D pantheon, some of which are really interesting origin stories for gods that you may be familiar with. One of these interesting stories is that before Bahamut and Tiamat, there was a dragon god named Asgorath. In his arrogance, he sought to take down one of the most powerful primordials alone and was cleaved in two. The remains of his body then regenerated to form Bahamut and Tiamat. This is kind of an interesting origin story to those dragon gods, and you get a lot of this kind of neat lore connected from the Dawn War. But ultimately, I'm getting sidetracked, and that's a topic for a whole other video. The main thing here is that we understand that there was this narrative of elementals versus angels, essentially. As such, the angels from 4th edition very much reflect that and are kind of meant to be these faceless beings that form up armies and all serve a very specific purpose. The whole idea being that they were essentially a template that would adapt to the form of the god or being they served. So first thing we're going to do is just cover the four different types of angels found in the monster manual from 4th edition and what they can do in battle, what their roles are, and then of course we're going to talk about some plot hooks and how you might be able to adapt this for your game. So first up, we've got the Angel of Protection. As her name would suggest, the Angel of Protection exists for the sole purpose of protecting their ward. This may very well be a god that they are beholden to, or it could even be a creature that their god has commanded them to protect. In some cases, this may even be a cleric who has summoned this angel from the astral plane or whatever plane their god resides on to protect them in battle. This angel is different from the others in the sense that it doesn't focus primarily on killing, but more so on staying alive and keeping its charge alive as long as possible. It will stop at nothing to do so and will gladly lay down its life if it means protecting that of its ward. The first way it does this is with an ability called Angelic Presence. With the divine power constantly around this creature, it is able to force one attack made against it each round to be rolled with disadvantage. Again, its abilities primarily focus around defense, so this is perfect if it wants to try to make its targets miss. 
The second part of this ability also forces all creatures within 25 feet of the Angel of Protection to move as if they were going through difficult terrain. Again, this is just trying to slow down its opponent and keep its ward alive as long as possible. The catch to both of these abilities though is that they only work if the Angel of Protection is within 25 feet of its protected creature. Not that the Angel of Protection will ever want to move outside of that range because it's gonna stick close to its ward, however it does present an opportunity for the attackers if they can split the creature from its ward in battle. The other big ability the Angel of Protection possesses is the fact that it can cast Warding Bond once per day. Now this doesn't function like the spell regularly would in the fact that it only lasts an hour, but it lasts until the angel dies. Once a creature is designated as the angel's ward, it remains as such forever. For those of you unfamiliar with what that spell does, it basically means that whenever the ward is attacked by anything really, it takes only half damage, and then the angel of protection takes the rest. This combination of abilities creates a pretty astounding defense for whoever is so blessed to be warded by the angel of protection. Now of course mere protection isn't going to be enough. In order to truly protect its ward, the Angel of Protection must have some kind of weapon. And that it does. These angels wield massive greatswords that come down with tremendous force and not only cause physical damage, but a ton of extra radiant damage as well. The Angel of Protection is what I view in my head when I imagine just the archetypal good angel. They descend from the heavens, have tons of abilities meant to protect and save creatures, and when their wrath is drawn down upon someone who would seek to destroy their wards, they will destroy that creature with radiant light. As for how you can use this angel in your game, the obvious application would be as the defender of some kind of cleric or demigod. If the party happens to be going up against such a foe, an angel of protection can make the fight a lot more difficult and a lot more complex. An angel of protection can also make a great boon for a noble cleric who has proven worthy to their god. Maybe a cleric in your game uses their divine intervention feat to call upon their god for aid in battle. It could be a really interesting and awesome way to have the skies literally split open and an angel of protection descend upon the party to protect them in the fight. Maybe even one for each party member, since this is the divine intervention ability after all. Thus, it doesn't just end the battle outright, but it gives them such a huge advantage against whatever they're fighting that victory is pretty much assured. Back to using them as enemies though, like I said, these angels tend to adopt the visage and appearance depending on what their god or beholden deity is. So there's no reason an angel of protection who happens to be serving an evil god wouldn't appear malignant and maybe it does necrotic instead of radiant damage. This could make a very good auxiliary unit for a death cleric boss battle or something like that. The only thing to keep in mind really no matter how you're using this is that the angel of protection is meant to protect. So put it in situations where it can do that and do it well and you're going to see it used to its maximum potential. Next up we have the angel of valor. These angels are the most numerous of all the angels and they tend to make up the bulk of celestial armies. They serve as reliable shock troops who are tenacious in battle and are capable of great feats of strength. Unlike the Angel of Protection, the Angel of Valor is all about head on assault and doing as much damage as possible. Rather than wielding a shield or anything defensive really, they charge headlong into the fight with a long sword in one hand and a dagger in the other. They're the lowest CR of the angels we're going to talk about today, so they can make great opponents for campaigns that are set in the celestial realms. If you have a party that for whatever reason has ticked off a god and that god is sending agents after them to destroy them, but it's not necessarily a huge priority that god would probably send Angels of Valor to get the job done. Also, in any celestial or angelic battle, they are going to be the bulk of what's out on the field. But that said, they're no pushovers. They're actually capable of calling down lightning on their targets to stun them and cause a lot of damage. In addition to that, they can also turn their blades into fire for the round so that they can pass through armor and hit their targets more easily, as well as causing lots of fire damage. Ultimately, if you use any of the other angels we're going to talk about today, Angels of Valor just make great pairings with them. So maybe you have one Angel of Protection and a dozen Angels of Valor to kind of round out the encounter. They're easier to defeat, but they're much more numerous, and if you don't defeat them quickly, they can cause just terrible damage. Again, if a cleric were to use its divine favor ability to help in a war situation, this would be a good opportunity for their god to maybe send an army of angels that are angels of valor. As the most numerous and sort of the front line of defense though for the angel armies, they don't really have any crazy signature abilities, but like I said, they are great units to round out pretty much any celestial encounter. To follow up on that, next we have the angel of battle. 
Angels of Battle are similar to Angels of Valor in the sense that they live for combat. However, they differentiate because they are much more powerful, much more intelligent, and they basically serve as the commander of the Celestial Armies. Well, to take down one large demon, it may take several Angels of Valor, an Angel of Battle will charge headlong in in a one-on-one -on -one fight, and probably win. They can fly extremely quickly, and they all carry into battle a giant flaming falchion. They're so fast, in fact, that they can actually fly up to half their move speed, make an attack, and then fly the rest of their move speed wherever they want, and they do not take an attack of opportunity. This is extremely dangerous against earthbound foes. Any creature that can't fly or shoot projectiles at an angel of battle is basically just going to get picked at until it dies. The angel of battle obviously knows this and is going to take advantage of that as much as it can. In addition to this, any creature who is struck by the angel's falchion is bathed in radiant holy light. This light grants advantage to all other characters who attack the target of the Angel's Falchion until the beginning of the Angel of Battle's next turn. This essentially functions like a fairy fire spell, albeit it only lasts one turn, but whatever target the Angel of Battle singles out in combat is sure to fall very quickly. The last ability the Angel of Battle possesses can be something meant to either quickly finish off a foe or a last ditch effort to basically do as much damage as it can before it dies. The Angel of Battle can extend its wings in a broad arc and shoot out razor sharp metallic feathers at any creatures within 15 feet of it. This attack does cause a crazy amount of damage, however by doing so, it limits itself to a 10 foot fly speed and it can only hover for the next hour. This is why I say it's kind of a last ditch effort. If it knows the foe is close to death and it can finish it off with this one attack, it may choose to do this. However, if the angel is cornered and it knows death is close, it's also going to do this just because it might as well to get as much damage done as possible before it perishes. As far as using this creature in your game, an angel of battle will often be found leading angels of valor. So if you're doing an encounter for a higher level party, you could definitely put one or two of these guys in the mix with some angels of valor. One interesting thing the book mentions though is that they might also be found commanding armies of men. So it is possible to have one of these creatures in your game say as an ally. If you're running a fairly war centric campaign and the party is searching for allies, maybe they can entreat a god to lend them several angels of battle to help lead their forces into conflict. Alternatively, an angel of battle gone rogue who maybe has some angels of valor under his command might make for a good final boss encounter for a mid-level party. That could actually make for a pretty interesting dungeon if you have an angel of battle who has taken up residence in some abandoned temple or something like that and is basically raiding the countryside. It could make for a different spin on the whole fallen angel stereotype. Lastly on our list today, we have the Angel of Vengeance. These creatures are a deity's wrath and anger personified. They possess powers of fiery vengeance and flames of true death. These angels appear massive in form and wield two long swords, basically ready to deal as much damage to a single target as physically possible. The way it will almost always start out combat is by placing its sign of vengeance upon a creature, whoever it's there to kill basically. Sign of vengeance functions very similarly to the spell Hunter's Mark except instead of granting advantage or extra damage, the sign of vengeance allows this angel to do something truly terrifying. At the beginning of each of its turns, rather than use its move action to move throughout the battle, it can use its move action to teleport to any square adjacent to its marked target. Meaning that that creature has no hope of escape until this angel is either destroyed or completely lost. Once it's up close and personal, which is exactly where it wants to be, it can make two devastating longsword attacks. These attacks deal a great amount of physical damage as well as fire damage and cold damage. The whole idea being that they are literally striking down its target with flames of death. To further emphasize its close quarters combat style, it has an ability that it can use once per day called Cold Fire Pillar. This ability literally transforms the creature into a 15 foot pillar of blue flame. Any creatures that are within 10 feet of it take fire and cold damage, and the angel is completely immune to all damages until the start of its next turn. This can be a great way to fend off damage from an impending attack, since it can be used as a reaction but it's also a great way to deal a lot of damage to several characters in a small area. This angel also possesses an ability called the Cloak of Vengeance. Basically, this cloak is a supernatural barrier that surrounds the creature at all times. Until this barrier is broken through, mechanically this means until the creature has lost more than half of its hit points, it can force one attack made against it each round to be made with disadvantage. In addition to this, however, any creature that strikes it with a melee or unarmed attack 
takes 1d8 cold and 1d8 fire damage. This angel doesn't really have much more in the way of defense, but that's not its purpose. This creature is meant to cut through a battle and kill one target very specifically with deadly force. I could see myself using this creature in any campaign where a character has wronged a god or a powerful cleric. If you have someone in your adventuring party that has really pissed off a cleric or the wrong deity, it's very likely that they will send an angel of vengeance after them. An Angel of Vengeance can also make for an interesting encounter in the wild, not necessarily as an enemy. Perhaps while the party just happens to be down the road, the sky splits open and an Angel of Vengeance descends onto the path. The party at first is probably going to be quite alarmed, and the Angel may not even necessarily notice their presence at first. However, after a moment, the Angel looks around and seems confused. His target isn't here. He questions the party, asking them about so-and-so, who is his target, the party may or may not know anything about this, but perhaps when the angel explains that he has been sent on a divine mission to strike down some evildoer, the party chooses to aid him. It's likely that the angel's target is using some sort of magic or ward to mask its presence. The angel, unfamiliar with the material world, might enlist the party to actually track him by more conventional means. If the party obliges, perhaps they're rewarded by the deity this angel serves for their service in hunting down this evildoer. If the party denies, maybe they actually end up with a fight on their hands. It's also very possible that the party will just antagonize the angel and attack it right away, thinking that they are under assault when, in fact, they are not the intended targets. All in all, there's lots of different options for what could happen there, but I think this encounter probably works best if the angel doesn't descend directly in front of the party. That seems a little bit too specific. However, if they see maybe off in the distance, just beyond the edge of the forest, there's some light that just descended from the sky, then they might be a little curious and go check it out. And that's when they would then find the angel and who knows what will ensue. There's a few different ways you could spin it, but I think that could be a pretty cool encounter. All in all, these angels basically just give you more options for your celestial encounters and adventures. It is worth mentioning there are a few other angels, I believe there are three other ones in the Monster Manual 2 from 4th edition. However, this video is already getting long enough as it is, so if you guys find this stuff interesting, maybe I'll do a second video covering those ones in the future. I do think angels kind of get a bad rap because they can be so, so interesting, but just given all the tropes and the way they're presented in some of the books, it can be hard to see what value they hold intrinsically aside from being big, dumb idiots with wings. I truly believe angels work best when they are terrifying. An encounter with an angel or a being like this should not be something easily forgotten, especially with something as powerful as like a solar or one of the major angels or some kind of archangel. If the party happens to encounter an angel like this, they shouldn't simply stumble upon him. They should see the heavens crack open with thunder and lightning while one of these beings descends like a thunderbolt directly to the ground. Seeing a Solar fight shouldn't just be he makes an attack roll, kills this guy, makes an attack roll, kills this guy. Solars are basically the closest thing you can get to a god without actually being a god. They are striking down swathes of enemy with a single swing of their sword as if it were nothing to them. Angels in a lot of cases can be divine fury personified, and that should be scary. Clearly I have a lot to say about this topic, and like I said, this video is already getting long enough. I think I may actually do a video just about using angels and demigods and that kind of thing in your campaign if that's something people would like to see, but that's something that we'll have to wait for another video. As for today, this is all I've got on the 4th edition angels, so hopefully you found this video helpful and hopefully it inspires you for some new things you can do in your game. If you do like what I do here and you want to support the channel, please subscribe, leave a like, leave a comment, tell me what you think about my videos and what you think about angels. We do have a Discord now as well, so if you're interested in chatting with other members of the community and myself, you can find a link to that in the uh, description below. And as some of you may already know, as per the channel update video, we have actually got a Patreon set up now, which I'm pretty excited about. So if you do want to support the channel in that way and you've got the capacity to do so, please, I encourage you to check that out. As always, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it, and I will see you next time.